Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like first to say thank you to the organizing committee uh, to give me the chance to give you an overview of uh, the planet formation process. And it's the first time for me to be in Vilnius and in any Baltic country, so I I'm looking very much forward uh, for this visit and may hopefully not skip a session, but have the chance to see something of Vilnius. So um, the overview of the talk, it's a very tight schedule, as you can see here. I will present something about the basic principles, the formation scenario, the orbital element evolution, and then something about the ensemble of exosolar planets. Um, I have to apologize that you didn't find an abstract in the abstract booklet, even though I sent it over a month ago and I got an email receipt. So but this is just what happens. So anyhow, you will get it now. The introduction. So you have seen this image quite a lot, I think. This is the mass of a planet here in Earth masses versus the orbital distance from their host stars. And you can see this diagram is filled not continuously, but there are certain, let's say, preferred hotspots where you find planets today. Okay. First, we have the hot Jupiters. They were observed first by the radio velocity technique. They are very massive and close to their stars, so they generate a large signal, easy to detect. Then we have what I would call the sort of normal Jupiters at the location where the, our Jupiter is here and they are a little bit more massive than Jupiter. And then we have um, the super Earth, which is this whole region down here, which is populated very heavily. And in this diagram, there is not, I think, um, very many Kepler planets because the Kepler planets, uh, from those we only know the radii and not the masses. So this is a problem here. So to know the mass, you would need the radio velocity and the Kepler planets or the host stars are too weak, too faint to get very good spectra. So this is the diagram, and of course, any, let's say, planet formation theory has as one of its goals to explain such a diagram, okay? The other diagram, which is, of course, more related to the physical properties of planets, and one uh, feature would be, for example, which is important here also, if you want to look for life on another planet, for example, the radius versus the mass of the planet. So these are physical characteristics which you can only get typically through transit observations where you observe the actual size of a planet in comparison to its host star. Okay, so we have here the, in, in blue the solar planets. Here is Earth and, and Venus, for example, Mars here, uh, Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn and Jupiter here. And these are the extrasolar planets as they have been ob observed. And, and a, a part of that from 2014, this diagram is here. So you can see of the rocky type planets down here. And some of the Kepler candidates lie certainly in this range. And then you have this huge amount of very massive and large, I would rather say large, uh, planets which have an, a radii which typically exceeds the radius of Jupiter by a huge margin here. And it is clear that with regular modeling of the planet, of the interior of these planets, you cannot reach such large radii. So there are additional effects, something like irradiation or internal heating, tidal heating by, uh, by the star or something going on here. So this is the other goal to explain uh, for extrasolar planets the physical structure and here the dynamical orbital structure. So how does planet formation proceed? This is the title of this talk here. <coughs> there are basically two pathways that theorists have considered. For one is the gravitational instability scenario where you start out from a disk where the planets form in and we will hear in the next talk something more about the disk structure and disk physics. And if the disk is very massive, so massive that the gravity, the self-gravity of the disk is important, it has the possibility to fragment directly into gaseous objects and form <coughs> planets within the disk. So this is something like star formation sort of in the Milky Way galaxy in a sense, okay? So it's the self-gravity of the disk that does it here. It has one big advantage basically that you can form planets very rapidly within a few thousand years, the whole planetary system can be formed. And this is, of course, for a regular scenario, a big challenge to do that. There we have always this time scale. Um, 
So on the other hand, you have this, the standard sequential accretion scenario here on the right-hand side, where you start from very small particles, and this is an interplanetary dust grain here, caught by this uh, military aircraft here. And from th this scenario says that you start out from this micrometer-sized dust grains through a sequence from billions and trillions of co uh, collisions, then you grow comets, asteroids, solids, and, and so on. And we have heard yesterday already something about comets, and these particles are believed to be the remnants of this very early process. And this is, the, of course, the preferred scenario for the solar system, and that's why in the following I would like to concentrate on this scenario, and this I just leave out for self-studies, and this is usually working for, let's say, the distant planets which are directly imaged. There, it would be the favorite scenario. <coughs> okay. So we go now to the formation scenario. Do you see here the basic, let's say, structure? You have a cloud, molecular cloud, gas and dust rotating, collapsing under the, its own gravity. You have a star in the center, you have a disk around it, and planet formation is thought to be an integral part of the star formation process and is going to proceed in within this disk here. Okay. <clears throat> so the initial growth, as I said, starts from very, very small dust grains, micrometer in size, and there are, if you want to do, uh, do, to study this, there are two approaches, basically. For one, you can do laboratory experiments here, <coughs> and this is done by a group in Braunschweig, for example, around Jürgen Blum and others. So they study the, the uh, collisions of these small particles under sort of semi-realistic conditions in the laboratory, uh, there's a special experiment where you have a free fall condition. You drop these particles from a free fall tower 100 meters or so on, so they have some time to be in free fall, and then you look how they condense. And you can see initially you have a sort of fractal type growth, and then when you have many, many of those collisions, you tend to compactify and become more spherical. And of course, the, the, the sticking forces are then generated here in the initial phase just by van der Waals type of forces. The other way is to do numerical simulations. I will just show you this animation by Alex Seitzinger, who was a student in Tübingen. So here we can see two of these fractal type particles here, and they collide here initially with a velocity of 0.4 meters per second. And this is the size of the individual monomers here, so they are micrometer-sized monomers. And then you add some forces between those particles here, and um, then you model these collisions uh, here. And then you have the second collision, which is with 0.8 meters per second, so faster collision. It hits the first particle, and since the velocity is faster, the third collision, even faster though, 2.5 meters per second, so you see if you don't take care, one high-speed collision can destroy everything you have done before. Okay? You start off with many, many collisions here, grow particles to larger sizes, and if their speeds become larger and their mutual uh, relative collision speeds become high, then you can destroy everything. This is the problem, or is one of the problems in the planet formation process, actually. So how do these particles behave in their disks? This is an image by, I stole from Jürgen Blum, and this is some German for you, if you like. So here are the observations here. You look from the side, for example, onto such a disk here. Here's the dust disk here, and this is the, the, the illuminated part from the surface layers. There's a jet also in this observation. So this is a true observation, and we believe that the structure of the disk here, uh, inferred from this, is it's, it's, it's rising, the disk vertical size height from, from the stellar distance here, you have the particles embedded in this gaseous disk here, and since they have different velocities than the gas, they don't feel the gas pressure, so these particles tend to move around within the gas disk, and you need some relative velocity of the dust particles to grow. So the relative velocity has two impacts. One impact is, <coughs> is positive. You need these to have growing collisions, of course. If they were all moving in a laminar way around the star, there would be no collisions at all, no growth. So you need relative velocities, but if they are too high, you might have destructive collisions also. So they have two sides, in fact, a good and a bad side. So you have Brownian motions, vertical sedimentation in the disk here, and you have, of course you have turbulence in the disk, still 
I would say, a rather unsolved problems and would be two or three talks by itself, just to talk about the turbulence in the disk. But anyhow, these particles move around, they are mixed up, but on average, they would tend to settle in the midplane. And since the particles have this relative velocity with the gas, they feel a drift, and typically they move inward. So this initial growth is, in fact, even though it sounds rather simple, not so well understood. There are still many problems. And they're all summarized basically under the keyword meter-sized barrier. There are basically three problems. Bouncing, small little particles when they hit each other, they do not stick, but they rather bounce off each other, just like two rubber balls, for example. This is a very common out outcome which people see in experiments. In simulations, it was not so obvious, so there's some theoretical discussion going on why you, why you have this bouncing, actually. Then you have fragmentation, I mentioned this. So whenever the relative velocities become too large, the critical velocity seems to be around 10 meters a second. And beyond that, particles tend to fragment upon collisions rather than grow. And this is most serious for meter-sized objects. So they, they tend to be destroyed most easily, and that's why we call this the meter-sized barrier. And the third problem is the so-called drift problem, gas particle interaction due to the relative velocities, leads to the drift, leads to a rapid inward drift of the particles. So they tend to be lost from one AU within 100 years into the star. So the average infall velocity is something around 50 meters per second, the radial drift velocity. So to overcome this, there have been several suggestions have been made. You can look, you can increase the porosity of the particles if they are porous and they collide. They can absorb a lot of their kinetic energy and they can stick. Yeah, if they were solid and no, not porous, they would just be destroyed, but porosity can uh, be an energy sink. Then the velocity distribution, typically the experiments have been done with, um, with a single relative velocity, but the velocity distribution can, of course, uh, lead to some growth and some, in the rare cases, some destruction of the average. You could have growth, for example, and also collisions of particles with different sizes can also lead potentially to growth. But this needs to be, let's say, determined in more detail. What is believed, maybe even more important, is particle concentration. So you pre-concentrate the particles at certain hotspots in the disk, and then you collide them, and then they grow. Okay? And one option here is, for example, vortices. So disks, as we will see later on also, Disks are not always uniform structures with smooth radial and azimuthal gradients, but very often you observe them and they have a strong axisymmetric feature, for example, a non-axisymmetric feature, sorry. And, and these features, for example, could be vortices in the dust disk, yes, in, in the gas disk here. So you have here, this I think is the vorticity plotted here, so you can see here there are certain uh, um, regions in the disk possible where you have like, just like a cyclone, yeah, you have, have an, an orbital uh, motion here around a center, and this center here is usually a pressure maximum, and particles tend to collect into these pressure maxima. This is an outcome of the drag forces here. Here you can see an image of this. So the dust particles here embedded in the disk tend to collect in these vortices. And I just came across a nice simulation of Clément Barreto and Shang Shu. And there you can see this here. So we have here particles coming in from the outer side. And here is a vortex. And you can see the dust particles are collected inside of this vortex here. And the ability to collect depends on the particle size here. You can see small particles, which are darker, blackish here tend to collect deep into the vortex here, and, and the larger the particle is, the more difficult it is to collect them into such a vortex. And here you have some other streams here, and they are so probably the Lagrange point L4 or something. So particles, it's possible to collect those particles in dust vortices, and once you have done that, of course you have increased the density, the density of these particles, of the, uh, this, uh, the surface density of these particles, <coughs> and then it's easier to, to grow to larger objects here. And it has been shown also in an alternative approach that uh, you can also collect those particles in turbulent eddies. You see here on the left you have an MHD simulation by Anders Johansen and others. So it's a full three-dimensional magnetohydrodynamic simulation of a disk, and uh, within this disk you can embed 
dust particles here, and these dust particles tend to condense into these uh, turbulent eddies here, and once they have reached a certain critical density, they can back react on the gas, which leads to a so-called streaming instability through which you can condense even more particles into these little hotspots. And if you add self-gravity, you can condense them here to solid bodies and can grow very fast on a very short time scale and overcome this meter size barrier and directly move onto to bodies which may be sort of serious type size, let's say 100 kilometer and more in diameters, okay? Then you can of course look what happens if you collide, let's say, into these individual collisions of two serious size objects here. And you can do this here, you have two, two objects here, 200 kilometers or, or, or in size, a few hundred kilometers in size, and one is just basalt solids, and here the, the object covered with a, with a uh, water layer in blue here, and you can see how they collide, and you can study in detail where does the solid material go, is it back re-accreted, where does the water go in, in such a collision, and then you can look possibly into water transport between those collisions here. And this is, in fact, science act presently going on in, in tubing and, and we look into this. Okay, the overview of this formation process would be you start out with very small particles, you collide, you stick to each other, you grow to kilometer, several kilometer size objects, and then gravity becomes important like in this simulation I've shown you about series, the series collisions here. So you have gravity assisted growth here and then later on you make, you create the gas, okay? So in the solar system and similar planetary systems, it's believed that the gaseous planets are formed at the later phases of the evolution, okay? You need first to form the cores, and then you add the gas, so this is the paradigm of the so-called core accretion scenario, okay? <coughs> I will not go into the gaseous planets in more detail, uh, but rather end, let's say, here at this point. Another important feature is the orbital evolution of these planets. So this is in fact determining after all the long-term evolution of planetary systems as they grow and even after, let's say, sort of their growth throughout the million, billions of years, there are still lots of interaction going on and the whole system is developing. So this would ask for explaining the eccentricity distribution, for example, which is displayed up here, very recent, and here the <coughs> inclination distribution, so as you know, the orbits of planets are inclined with respect to the rotation axis of their central host star, which is depicted here, and all these dynamical features can be explained or may be explained by, by interaction between the planet and the disk, as well as planet-planet interaction. <coughs> so there are two main, let's say, main features if you want to look at this disk-planet interaction here. For one, there are the spiral arms. You know if you embed a planet in a disk, you may have seen such a picture here, similar to this one. You have a planet in a disk here, the disk, the planet generates these spiral arms here, which is basically the superposition of all the sound waves emanating from the planet in the disk, and through, due, due to the shearing motion in the disk, these are, are sheared out and, and formed into these nice spiral arms. So physically, this spiral arm is pulling the planet back as a mass enhancement here. This spiral arm is pulling the planet forward. The planet orbits this way, by the way. So you can see these spiral arms generate some torques on the planet. The torques changes the angular momentum, and angular momentum is related to the distance to the planet. So they can change the distance, which we call migration. And you can see here, this arm here just optically, let's say very easy, this arm is, is bigger and so we have a drag force backwards which leads to inward migration by this mechanism here, the Lindler torques. And then you have the second part here, the corrotation torques, which is in fact nice to look at an animation by Frederick Marseille here. So you have a gas particle here in the disk. You're in a, in a frame co-rotating with the planet here, so the planet is here. The gas particle moves into this horseshoe orbits here. Whenever it comes close to the planet, you can see it gets a little kick. It moves on this horseshoe trajectories, and the kick with the planet means angular momentum transfer. So there's a torque generated, and in the ideal case that there is no gas, 
whatsoever. No drag. This could go forever, like in the horseshoe regions around Jupiter, for example, the Trojans here. But if you have a, a viscosity and other thermal effects of the disk, you get generated asymmetry here, asymmetry near the planet, that this jump is different from that jump here, and you can generate a net torque acting on the planet, and the planet can move around. Okay? And if you add up all these torques given by this corrotation region, the horseshoe region, you find that they are typically directed outward. And then you have to calculate the difference between those inward torques and these outward torques, and you find that the difference can be sometimes positive or negative. So the planet might even move outward or it moves inward. And the details depend on the, detail, on the disk thermodynamical structure and the viscosity in the disk. So you can easily imagine situations where you can have for the same mass, for example, inward motion, or you can have for the same planet mass, outward motion. So to know this in detail, what happens, you need to do a simultaneous study of the disk evolution and the planet evolution, basically. So if you look at the detailed disk structure here, including accretion and stellar radiation and radiative um, uh, modeling here, you can generate these so-called, I would call them migration maps here. So what is plotted here is the planet mass here and the uh, versus distance. And in color coded is the torque. And if the torque is positive, the planet would move out. If the torque is negative, the planet would move in. So you can see zero is here the greenish part. And if you go outwards of this black curve here, black curve means exactly zero torque. If you go outwards, you can see you become negative. So in all this regime here, let's say 20, 10 Earth masses at this distance, you would have, have inward migration. And at whatever, three masses, ma Earth masses at this distance, you would have outward migration. Yeah? So you can construct these maps for disks and look at which location the planet of your given mass, favorite mass, moves outward or inward. And you can combine this type of uh, map then uh, with your evolution simulations of, of planet, uh, planet of samples of planets, for example. I will have to skip this here. So the uh, migration is always the, the question, is migration really necessary or not? And uh, I would say, yes, it is necessary. It's not only necessary, but it's a consequence of Newton's laws, actually, because the planet disturbs the disk, so the density in the disk is changed, and this change in density of the disk back reacts on the planet, so migration is basically inevitable. So many scenarios that try to form planets in situ and do not account for any migration, I think they have serious problems physically to be correct. I mean, of course, you can argue you can make hot Jupiters there by whatever uh, accreting the mass coming from the outside of the disk or accreting slowly the solids and so on, but then there would always be migration. It's inevitable. And there's some, let's say, indication the existence of resonant planetary systems is very clear. They are not formed in these special locations, but they have been brought there through dissipative processes in the disk. And then we have the hot Jupiters. Yes, and they are in, in very, in, in these, uh, in the disks, they, uh, they are, they have moved uh, uh, from outside to that locations here. And that they are, since, as I said, the migration issue depends very delicately, I would say, on the disk properties also. There's many new, let's say, results in the last years in explaining the more detailed aspects of this process. The main problem is still the migration speed, which is very, can be very fast under very simple assumptions here, and the direction of the migration. And we can do the same game for eccentricity and inclination to look what planet-disk interaction does to those orbital elements. And as you can see here from the figures, they're very intuitive. So whenever you start with some eccentricity or some inclination here, you will find that they are damped relatively fast. And they are damped much faster than the migration. So the damping time scale for eccentricity and inclination is of the order h over r times shorter than the migration time where h is the disk vertical thickness, which is small, and r is the radius from the, from the star. So eccentricity and inclination are always damped. So as a result, we expect that planetary systems 
are, are flat, they are confined to the disk midplane and on circular orbits. So how do we get the large inclination and eccentricities that we actually observe? So I think the idea is twofold here. You start with migration first in the disks, so the planets are embedded in the disks, they migrate, move around, and if you have several of those planets, they can tend to compactify, they become closer, and if they are close enough, or once they are close enough, you start n-body simulations with a few planets here, and then the disk is gone, you continue this n-body simulations, and you can excite the whole system here and get large eccentricities and large inclinations, which roughly are in agreement with the observations. So the results for high eccentricity inclination is, is a consequence of migration and scattering. So you have both processes operating here. Ensembles. So this is, comes to the last chapter here in my talk. I don't see any signal yet from Eva, so I can continue very easy. So, ensembles. So you want to look to us, or do you want to understand the whole uh, ensemble of extrasolar planets and understand, for example, some correlations here. Let's say, for example, the metallicity correlation that stars that have higher metallicity tend to have more planets, or at least for massive planets, that stars with higher stellar mass tend to have more massive planets. Okay? For small mass planets, there is no such a clear relation here, but for massive planets, there seems to be. And one can understand those relations and also the mass distance relations and others through a, a, a system called. Uh, uh, calculation called population synthesis models here, and you construct theoretical models of the planetary evolution simultaneously with the disk evolution, and then you try to infer some, some parameters here, and, and many, uh, several groups have done this, basically, basically two groups here, the Bern group, Jan Alibea, Willy Benz, and, and Christoph here, and Jan and Christoph are here in the room, and then we have Shigeru and, and Doug Lin uh, doing this. Okay. So this is a sample example for the disk evolution. So you take some disk evolution here plus planet evolution, combine this, yes, and you can see how the disk evolves here, surface density versus um, distance, and you combine that and do this for many, many planets in different disks around different mass stars and so on with different viscosities, and then you construct these whole samples of, of planets here and you can get something like, which is drawn here, a, a movie I stole from Christoph Modassini. See here, they are the, the planetary cores. So you have planetary mass here and distance. This was the very first diagram I showed. And here you see the evolution of these objects throughout time. Here time is running here. So this is combined disk evolution plus planet evolution. Yeah? And these are different migration regimes in different colors here. So you see many, many hot star, hot planets formed here, and some planets are just stuck here where they are, and then you try to figure out whether this final state agrees with what we observe today. And then you vary the disk mass, you vary the viscosity, you vary some growth models for planets, you vary migration, and so on, and then you try to find the best fit. And of course, there are many parameters, but the idea is to identify the most crucial parameter that determines the eventual distribution and to improve on that. For example, we learned much more about type one or type, uh, migration by looking at, uh, by comparing the results of these population synthesis models with actual observations. And of course, which is more important than is to get the planetary initial mass function, that is how many planets with the bot mass are actually produced predominantly. Okay, so we can here, we see the number of planets with a certain mass here, and here there are two distributions compared. In blue, we have here the results of this type of modeling here, and in gray, we have the observed distribution here, and as you would say, there's a rough, rough agreement with it. So we can even see, let's say here, the, the uh, massive Jupiter-type planets, and we, we can see that there's a strong rise towards small planets, and the question is here whether the observed distribution shows some turnover here when we go actually to the planet, to the terrestrial mass here, or whether it goes up like the theoretical distribution. There is some indication from the observations, even though those small masses can hardly be reached, that there is a turnover, that we have fewer planets when we go actually to very small mass here. But I'm not an expert on this, so 
maybe some other people in the room are. Okay. And finally, I would like to mention a few words about the hot super earth systems. Those systems are, which is mentioned here at the bottom, very common. This is probably the most common uh, type of planet. And if you look for planetary systems, they are typically very compact, as we can see here. So these are several Kepler candidates here on the top. And on the bottom, we have the solar system here, but it's scaled down by a factor of 10. Okay, just keep that in mind. So this is a solar system scaled down by a factor of 10. And then we can see then the solar system would resemble the Kepler system. So these are really very close to the star, very compact, very common. And since they come from Kepler, we know that those systems are flat. Okay, these are very flat systems, flatter often than the solar system. Okay, and how can you understand the formation of such systems here? And following the, the, um, the line of thought that I gave you before, it's a, it's a combination of migration here of these objects, of collisions between these objects and their mass growth, and then scattering collisions, scattering between these objects. So I think the most likely scenario is also migration, collision, scattering, and then you end up with configurations where the simulation here drawn at the bottom is similar to the observed cases. Okay. But those planetary systems or super-Earth super planets seem to be the most common planets here. Okay, that brings me to the summary. So I've told you that the formation is collisionally driven here for the solar system. There is the option of the Gaussian stability. The evolution of orbital elements is done through planet disk and planet-planet interactions here. And multibody interactions are very important. There's the other option I didn't mention, tidally driven migration, an alternative. For ensembles, you have statistical evolution of many, very many realizations. And we can infer important uh, clues about the formation channels here. What is missing here is in these ensembles, but people are working on this, is to study the formation of multiple planetary systems simultaneously. So with more than one planet here in, in this sub evolution. In the future, we may hear more about this here in this conference. Actually, the atmospheric characterization, of course, is important. The likelihood of habitable planets, the main topic here. The uniqueness of the solar system is the question here where uh, you think also that the Grand Tech model, which is also a combination of migration and collisions and scattering, by the way, plays a role. So if the formation of habitable planets requires something like this here, then the question is how likely this is. And then, of course, the evolution of life in such planetary systems. Thank you very much. <laughs>